Get your Bibles and uh, open them up to John chapter 3. John chapter 3. If you don't have a Bible, uh, there's one right in front of you, in the seat in front of you. And as you're turning there, we're continuing our, our series of the church. And we're finding out so many different things. Have you guys been getting a lot out of, or at least a somewhat out of the, the series? Yes. yes. Okay, good. All right. I, throughout the past few weeks, I've been really receiving a lot of different questions and whatnot, and that's really good. Um, questions are meant for us to dig deeper, not to stump the pastor. Okay? All right, so we know that God has all the answers, and, um, but this is really, I've been telling everybody, this has been a real journey for all of us, uh, me included. So we're journeying together. Uh, but the, uh, the first week we went into... Um, finding out about missions. How does the church, how does this church view missions? And uh, Jeff Kohler and his team who went to Mississippi to do mission work there, uh, they got an opportunity to let us know what God is doing there. And then the, uh, the other three weeks that followed, we found out um, who the church is. And this week, we're going to be going into the message called Who Belongs to the Church? Who Does Belong to the Church? We we need to find that out. Uh, we found out so many different things. We know that Jesus Christ is the head of the church. We know that the church is made of people who believe in Jesus Christ, but um, we're going to be going into that in a little bit more in depth with who belongs to the church. And this sermon today, it's very, 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 very possible that most of you have heard this sermon before. Um, in different ways, in different formats. Um, many times like this, in a sermon like this, sadly, uh, people will reject its message. That's sad, but true. Um, they'll come in on Sunday mornings, they'll give it a listen, but they won't really hear the message. And Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Sometimes people come in, they hear a message like this, and they tend to nod off. I've done it too. And they leave unchanged. Some people already say, well, I know the message. I understand it. I've been there before. I've done that. And for whatever reason, you know, some people will say, well, I don't need this message. I, you know, it's not for me or whatever. But some will hear the message. And they'll walk away changed and they'll have been given a new life. And some that have already been given a new life, they'll hear a message like this and it will, it will motivate them to go out and reach people for Christ. And this is that, that one action right there, that's one of the many actions, one of the many steps that separates a church goer into a follower of Jesus. Somebody said, I'm taking this seriously. I, I, I fully understand that what he wrote here is truth. Therefore, I follow him. It separates churchianity from reality. I don't need churchianity. I don't need religion. I don't, you can have that. It's a waste of my time. But when, when we have the book here, when we have the Bible, and Jesus says something, Follow my logic on this. Since he created the universe and he created us and he gave us a message, does it not make sense to follow him? Doesn't it make sense to follow him? It, it, it should. And so why am I going to be preaching a, a sermon called Who Belongs to the Church? One, it's part of the series. I don't feel like God wants us to understand that, but it's, it's important that we know as a church in a technical sense who belongs to the church, but it also, we need to make sense in our, in our hearts. We need to know who's made God's role book, who's written in the Lamb's book of life, as the Bible says. But look, passionately from my heart, here's, here's why I wanna preach this message is because I want all people who hear this message, I want all people be able to join me in this journey of enjoying God 
enjoying God. And, and, I, and I want people to, to be able to enjoy his presence. And I want people to be able to experience eternity with Christ. And honestly, I want people to avoid hell. Now, here, let me stop. Let me stop it right here. Usually when people hear of, hear me out, please. Please hear me out. Usually when people hear a message like this, they tune out. And here's what they capture from it. All we hear is hell. All we hear is going to hell. And then therefore we, we scrub the rest of it and we walk out. We check out and we walk out. I'm asking you, don't do that. If you're not gonna hear what I have to say, hear what the word has to say. Because that's mo most important anyway. Amen. I'm, I can come and go. And so can all the other preachers yeah. across the world. But this, let this sink into your heart. Mm -hmm. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You have to understand that messages like this, this is where the preacher lives. In fact, the, the greatest preacher of all, Jesus Christ, said as much when he said that the reason that he came was to seek and save that which was lost. That's where he lived. That's why he came to this earth. He came here to get you. He came here to get me. And every sermon, every word from Jesus was to ensure that people knew him and knew that they would spend eternity with him. Or he wanted them to have that message out there so they would have the opportunity to know. They can make a choice. So for these next few minutes, here's my question. I, I wonder, do we have ears to hear? And I hope we do. John 3, chapter 1 through 21. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, or the ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that come from God, and for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Let me, let me underline, let me un underscore something. Western culture and American culture did not exist 2,000 years ago, all right? And people think that the term born again came up from a bunch of people in the South. I can tell you, I'm from the South. I didn't make this term up, okay? Jesus made this term up. And he said, truly, truly, I say to you, you can't see the kingdom of God unless you're born again. And Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he's old? I'm confused. Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus said this. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh. Baby comes from baby's mom. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. A wicked, vile, deceptive sinner like me. Not like me, but me. Touched by God, forgiven by God. He sends his Holy Spirit and says, wake up. Ask me for forgiveness, and I will do it. Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, Jesus said, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus, then he said to him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered him, are you the T are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things? I mean, you're the Pharisee on top of all the other Pharisees. You don't get it? 
Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you, you don't receive our testimony? If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You're not getting it here in the natural realm, but we can see and touch. How, how, can the, how in the world can you understand heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, me, the son of man, he says. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the son of man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. I just gave you the key, he said. Nicodemus, here it is. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Not if you go to church on Easter. Not if you go to church on Christmas. Not if you tip your hat to God every once in a while. Not if you teach a Sunday school class. But in order that the world might be saved through him, through Christ. Not how good and awesome you are. God is not impressed with us. He loves us. He's not impressed. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe is condemned already. They've they made their choice. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. There is no other name on heaven or earth by which you can be saved. It is only through Jesus Christ. And this is the judgment that light has come into the world and people love the darkness. We love darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. That's right. He said it right here. He says, Scott Welch, what you do in private and secret, you think nobody else can see is evil. I'm calling you out. I'm putting my finger on your sin right now. It's evil. For everyone who does wicked things, verse 20, hates the light. It does not come to the light. They don't want it, lest his works should be exposed. Don't catch me at what I'm doing wrong. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. John chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. Jesus is saying this, not me. I repeat it, I see it in the word, you see it in the word, follow along. So we have the story of Nicodemus, he is a ruler of the Pharisees, he is the ruler. He hears about this man, Jesus, so I got to put my pride aside. I got to go see this man, because this man, something's going on with him. In fact, so much so... He's from God because he's doing things that are only things that God could do. I got to go see him, but I can't let the people that I work with, I can't let them see me. I've got to do this in private. And probably at that time, it was wise for him to do that. So he makes a, a, he makes a meeting with him at night. He goes to see this guy. Now, remember, this is a, this is a religious leader. This is a guy who's supposed to have it together. And he goes to see Jesus. And Jesus is awesome. And here's why. Have you ever, those of you that know Jesus Christ, have you ever noticed how relatable and approachable he is? Have you ever noticed that? Walk with him, driving down the street, and you could swear he's like sitting right there, you know. But he's, he's everywhere, right? But there's that sense, that presence. The presence of the Lord just being with you right there to minister to you in your hurt, in your pain, in your brokenness, in your joy, in your gladness, and all the neat things that God through his common grace gives. We experience Jesus. So Nicodemus meets him by night, and Jesus throws him a loop. 
<laughs> you must be born again. And it rocks his world. How does this happen? I, I, I don't know. Now remember, here today, right here, in this service, we're talking about who belongs to the church, okay? So let's keep that in mind. We're going back to the story of Nicodemus. We're going to make all these connections in a minute. But follow what we're saying here. Got a man, the man of the Pharisees, the teacher, meets Jesus at night. Jesus says, you must be born again. You must be born again. Jesus throws him a loop. And, and he, <coughs> he says several different things, but one thing I, I do want to, I want to focus on verse five. And he says, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Is he talking about baptism there? I don't think so. In fact, I'm pretty sure. No, I'm definitely sure. Because here's the way that God works in, a, in an amazing way. And let's say I did not know Jesus Christ. I go out in the street after this service. And I meet somebody. And we're talking. And he gives me, this person gives me the gospel. And I believe. And I, my life has changed. And now I'm a child of God. And then a truck hits me. I get run over, all right? Big old, let's put it this way, here in Ohio, big old tractor comes down with a big old thing. <laughs> comes rolling over. And I got, can you see the, the, the tire tracks on my back and everything? I get, and I get splat, run over. There I am. Okay. Now, I just heard the gospel, believed the gospel, got saved. I didn't get a chance to get baptized. Am I going to heaven? Yes. Yes. yes, absolutely, because of the belief, because of the Holy Spirit. This is a work of the Spirit. He wakes me up. You have that responsibility to believe. You have that choice. Choose to believe. Believe, he believes. And then he gets run over by an Ohio tractor. <laughs> That's it. But he goes to heaven, so he doesn't have to worry about the tractor anymore. Okay? This is how this works. In Psalm 51 2, the Bible talks about repentance. That is turning away from who you are, your selfishness, turning away from your sin, and turning towards God. And Jesus, knowing that Nicodemus is a teacher of the law, would know that when he talks about spirit and water and all that, he knew that Nicodemus would catch on to these things because he himself is a teacher of the Jewish law. And he would understand if he used words and phrases that he could understand, he was talking to him in his language, that that would help to turn the key for Nicodemus. So he uses a phrase here, born of water and spirit. So what is he talking about here? Psalm 51, 2, he says, David, King David, by the way, King David, he was an amazing man of God. He, he was a man after God's own heart. But check this out. He ended up watching a lady named Bathsheba have it, had an adulterous affair, sinned against God, had Bathsheba's husband killed. I mean, the guy was really messed up. And yet, he came to God and he asked for forgiveness. And he's pouring out his heart to God, King David is. And he says, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. It's, God was not going to give him a shower. Okay? We're looking at, a spirit's, at the Spirit's work. Ezekiel 36, 25 through 27. He says this, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your unclean uncleanness and from your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules Ephesians 25 through 26 if that if the Old Testament didn't speak to us 
Let's have the New Testament speak to us. Ephesians 25 through 26. The Apostle Paul uses the, the, uh, the understanding of marriage to get this point across. And he says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he may sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word. Getting this into you, getting the Bible into you, it's like clean water washing you out. Titus 3, 4 through 7, But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works that we did done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, catch this now, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And he is telling Nicodemus right here, he is saying, this is a, this is a work done by the Spirit. You have that responsibility to say yes to God, but when you do, you're going to be washed by me. Amen. You're going to get cleansed. This is a work God is going to do. There is no other name by which we must be saved but Jesus Christ. It is not us that does this work. We cannot work our way to heaven. We cannot be good enough. Your ego does not go that far. <laughs> Because we think we have it all under control, especially men, hear me, especially men, because it is so hard for us to hear. Huh? That's exactly right. What? It is so hard for us to hear, and we've got it under control, don't we? We do. We think we do. And God says, no. In fact, probably one of the toughest men alive, John the Baptist said, I must decrease he must increase right. in me. Mm -hmm. If a man like that that dressed up in camel hair and ate locusts and yelled out in the desert about the Spirit of God, that guy's pretty tough. Maybe I should listen to him. And he's got a point there. He tells Nicodemus, you want to be in the kingdom of heaven, be born again. You must be born again. You must believe. It's your responsibility to, to believe. Believe. You want to be in the church? In God's church, you must believe. So we're going to go over a few things that are going to nail this point home. Here's what we need to understand. We need to understand your condition. Understand your condition. Mankind's heart is wicked. If you're taking notes, it's well worth taking notes on this. Understand your condition. Mankind's heart is wicked. We are nice people. We are friendly people. I get that. There are some really neat people out there. I know there are some, you know, by human standard, there are some evil people out there, but... Mostly it seems like, especially in this community here, nice people. But you've got to understand that mankind's heart is wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10 said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind given to every man according to his way, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doings. God says, you want to be evil? I'll give you the fruit of that. But you need to understand, mankind, your heart is wicked and desperately, desperately wicked and deceitful, always trying to figure a way out. Understand your condition. We are lawbreakers, Romans 3, 19 through 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped. 
and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Through the law, the knowledge of sin comes. How does that work out, Pastor Scott? Let me tell you. If you ever committed murder, most of you would probably say no. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, if you have anger in your heart towards someone, you've committed the act in your heart already. You're already under the judgment. Have you ever committed adultery? Some of you may say yes. But those of you who may say no, Jesus is going to throw you a curveball. If you lust after a woman in your heart, you've already committed the very act of adultery in your heart. So now we find out that we're murderers and adulterers. And the book of James said that if we've broken one law, it's as if we've broken them all. So we are lawbreakers, cosmic lawbreakers. So we're wicked, we're lawbreakers, we're children of wrath. What, what do you mean children of wrath? That's not American Christianity. Pastor Scott, don't you understand? Jesus, don't you understand? That's not American Christianity. That's not what we should be teaching in churches. Don't, don't do that. But it says here in Ephesians 2, 3, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. The Bible says that the wrath of God, because we've committed sin, because we are sinners, the wrath of God rests on people. We are lost. Matthew 18, 11, and I like how the New King James Version says this, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. It comes from a Greek, Greek word that means away from. We are away from God. Can't find our way back. We can try, but we can't find our way back. We are lost. We are also slaves to sin. Romans 6, 17 it says, you who were once slaves to sin. You were on the slave block of sin, being sold to the highest bidder, which was Satan. And yes, he's real. And we do have a real enemy out there. And he just pulls you around wherever he wants to take you. Back in the old days, in the Roman days, I think I've shared this with, with some of you before, but they put that nose ring in that nose. Not like we have today, not these little skinny little things. They put a good sized nose ring in you and they string that chain right in your nose. And they go to the next person, the next slave, and the next slave. So if anybody got out of line, your nose would be ripped. And you're walking with your slave master all the way down to the next place. Your slaves sin. And we find out we're blind. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, in their case, the God of this world, who is Satan, has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. We have an enemy out there. We also find out that we are dead. Before Christ, we are dead. Ephesians 2, 1, and you were dead. Not just like, oh, I'm... I'm in the sea and I'm splashing around in water. Oh, help me help. No, we are dead. We are at the bottom of the ocean. We're dead spiritually. And we were dead in trespasses and sin. So from what the Bible says, we're wicked lawbreakers who are children of wrath, lost, slaves to sin, blind, and dead. And the hymn that we just sang it is no wonder there's a word in amazing grace that describes us as a wretch. That hymn writer knew exactly what he was talking about. He did not get his theology from his mind, from the latest thing of culture, whatever culture tells Christians how to act, 
and how to believe. No, the hymn writer got it straight from the Word, from the Word of God. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. God is in the business of taking the ego and crushing it, taking pride and stamping on it, and saving people. Because he loves us. Oh, he loves us. And let me tell you something. It's, I know this is so difficult for everybody to hear. It's difficult for me to hear, but listen. We cannot understand God's grace and our desperate need for Christ until we understand our identity as a sinner against him. We can't understand the good news until we understand the bad news. It makes The good news makes no sense, and we will trample on the good news unless we know the depth of our sin. So at this point, no one can belong to the church. Nobody. At this point, nobody belongs in God's kingdom. So, we need to understand what Christ's conditions are. And his conditions are this, be born again, John 3, 7. He said it, and I'll say it again. You must be born again. He did not say, and I know it can be difficult to hear over and over again, but he did not say, do, do the right thing. Do good things. No, he said, you must be born again. So, Christ's conditions, be born again. Believe. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes, whoever believes, don't clean yourself up before you come to Christ because you can't. He will do that work. He will do that sanctifying work. Sanctifying to set apart. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. I see there is a consequence there for not believing. But have eternal life. Believe that Jesus died to pay for your sins, that he rose from the dead and is alive today. Believe it. Amen. Believe it. Understand Christ's conditions. Be born again. Believe. Repent. Acts 3, 9, 19 says, Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out. Repent from your sin and your way of living life. Turn to God and the life that he has for you. As we read earlier in our scripture, we read John chapter 3, and then we read Matthew chapter 25. All of this reminds me of, of a story of when I was a kid. Um, I used to go out to my uh, uh, aunt and uncles out in the country in Louisiana, and they had, uh, they had crops there. They would raise soybeans. And um, during the wintertime, especially like it was during February that I remember this story, uh, all the rows were empty, of course, because it's not a time for growth. And, and so you have some of the sticks and stuff that are still up a little bit and uh got a little bit of rain it's a little bit chilly it's not like february in in ohio mm -hmm. but in louisiana it's just chilly enough and boy the the wind was out and we were able to take the, the kites out and so we go down to the little uh grocery store and uh get the little trinkets and stuff you could buy little trinkets and we would always ask our aunt and uncle hey can you buy us this and that and they would spoil us and whatnot but we uh we we scored some kites that day and uh it's really neat so and, and you know when you get a kite you got to get the kind that got the strong string but not only that get the extra string because you want to see it go as high as it can right and then you tie the that string together because you know the string in the in the packet that they give you with the kite it's like 10 yards long who wants to be doing this all day you don't want to be doing that no because it's going to land right ooh, it's going to land right on you just like with my glasses so what you do is you take those take the long string you take that string and tie it together 
And so we went out there, and boy, we had us a great time. And here's what we would do. We would take our shoes off because we didn't want to get them muddy. And so we just had bare feet out there, and we're running like this over the, the roads. And the whole time, we're getting muddier and muddier and muddier, and our feet are all muddy. And by the time we get like about 12 rows, our feet are totally covered in mud, and so we have these mud shoes. And so no matter where we walk, if we walk on glass, no problem. It's okay, because our feet are protected by all this mud. Here's the problem, though. When you're done, you flying the kite and all the rest, you know, your aunt and uncle, they're not going to let you go back in the house. And so what do they have to do? They have to clean you off. They have to hose you down. And so you're like scrubbing and scrubbing. That Louisiana mud gets right in there. You might have a crawfish stuck to you. You might have all kinds of stuff. You never know. But you, you hose it down. You hose them down. Get them clean. Jesus said, be born again. Right? He said, be born again. Hey, I want to clean you. I'm, I'm going to be going to the cross. I'm going to pay for your sins. You're going to give your life over to me, and we're going to clean you up. I know you have a past. But we're going to get clean. To point, the, to point it in the right, keep it pointing in the right direction, as we read earlier, Jesus gives us a picture of what happens at the end. On one side, he pictures the people as sheep, and on the other side, he pictures people as goats. This is the people, the sheep. He says he's going to place the sheep on his right but the goats on the left and the king will say to those on his right, he says, come, you are who, who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. And I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, uh, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. <laughs> Jesus is not making the point of do a whole bunch of works and you'll get to heaven. He's not saying that. He's saying as a result of what the work that the spirit has done in your heart to turn you from a vile sinner against God who is shaking his fist, maybe not verbally, but because you refuse to come to Jesus to get your sins forgiven. By that very act, continually you are shaking your fist. And Jesus says, but those of you who've said, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ, because of that, Jesus does this work in your heart and changes you so that you want to do these things. You want to visit the sick. You want to do everything in Jesus' name. Because the Bible says that whatever you do, whether it's eating or drinking, whatever it is, do it all in the name of Jesus. But then he will say to those on his left, depart from me. Sir, ma'am, depart from me. I never knew you. Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. It was not prepared for human beings. It was prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. Why? Because you did not believe in me. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. Why? Because you did not believe in me. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Why? Because you did not believe in me. Naked and you did not clothe me. Why? Because you did not believe in me. Sick and in prison. Why did you visit me? Because you did not believe in me. Then they will also answer saying, Lord, when, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison? And did not minister to you. And then he will answer them saying, truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Because I was too proud. 
because it didn't fit, it didn't fit my American lifestyle. Because I don't know what he is going to think of me. Because I have too many things to pursue right now. But this is the magnificence of the love of God. Watch this in Romans 5 8. He says, But God demonstrates his own love in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He was nailed to a cross. He was beaten, nailed to a cross. And he bled, right? Mm -hmm. And he bled, and he died. We have a question to answer here. Who belongs to the church? Listen to this. The gospel is meant for the wicked, the lawbreaker, children of wrath, the slave of sin, the lost, the blind, and the dead. That's who the gospel is meant for. It's meant for people like me. And it's meant for the human race. Because that's what the human race does. And the church is made of those who are redeemed from wickedness and breaking God's law. The church is made of those who are children of God, not children of wrath. The church is made of those that are found and not lost. The church is made of those who have been set free from sin and not slaves to sin. The church is made of those who are given sight they're not blind anymore. And the church is, th is for those who are made alive to Christ. They are not dead in their sins anymore. Why? Because praise God, Christ died for our sins and rose three days later. And is at this time sitting at the right hand of the Father and saying, I love my church. I love my children. I want them. I pursue them. I must have them. I want to have intimate connection with them. I want to talk to them. I want them to pray to me. And I love them. And I will walk them through hell if I have to. I am there for them. I am Jesus Christ. I am the Lord of the universe. And these, these are my people. This is my church. I am the head of this church. I love them. And I want more of them. Church, go get them. What he does. He does not want to see, he does not desire the death of the wicked. Who belongs to the church? Those who have believed and put their trust in Christ and have repented from their sin. That's who belongs to the church. If that is not you, Listen to what God is telling you. He cannot be any clearer than what his word has said. For some of you, and even for some of you that are listening via internet, it may be, if you're playing games, it's definitely time to stop playing games. For those of you that do know Christ, and you're not taking the opportunities to reach out to people. Why? I'm so proud of of Nicole and, and the, the crew, the team that came out yesterday to the laundromat to pay for people's laundry and to do people's laundry. I'm so proud of them. They were flawless in their faithfulness. Amen. But why? Because they had a burden for the lost to go out there and reach people for Jesus Christ. Amen. I read the stats on Facebook yesterday. Over this past week, about 2,000 people saw our posts. Over 2,000 people saw our posts 
on Facebook about uh, some of that being uh, about the, the laundry outreach. That's 2,000 people that said, there's a church out there that loves Jesus. There's a church out there that is pointing to Jesus. Why are they pointing to Jesus? Let me make the connection. Who is Jesus? I got, I got to find out who Jesus is. Therefore, I find out who Jesus is. I find out that I have sinned against a holy God. And now the opportunity is there for me to get my sins forgiven. That's how this works. Those of you who are Christians, get out there. You have a sphere of influence that nobody else has. And God wants to use you to bring more into his church. He loves people. He loves, I don't know why he loves people, but he loves people. <laughs> I do know why he loves people. He loves people because he loves people. That's who he is. He's our creator. Well, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for everything that you're doing in our midst. For those that do not know you as Lord and Savior, have them to surrender to you and ask you for forgiveness. And for those of us who do know Jesus, inspire us, motivate us, give us boldness to share the good news of Jesus so that others can be added to your church. In the name of Christ.